everybody, welcome to the PC Perspective Mailbag. I'm Ryan Shrout. I will be uh, your host throughout this afternoon, evening, or morning, whenever you have to be watching this. This is uh, uh, this is the show where we, or the segment where we answer the questions that you submit, either through the YouTube channel or through the comments on PCPer.com. Sometimes we ask for questions on Twitter as well. Uh, so if you have a question for the next episode, leave it on the comments to this video, either on YouTube or on PCPer.com, and we will uh, we'll take a look. Uh, let's go ahead and jump into what we got here. A lot of stuff up front on the NVIDIA announcements, which does make a lot of sense. Street Lord Street Guru asks, can you give us any details on AMD's GPU open real-time ray tracing versus NVIDIA's solution? Uh, I don't have, uh, there's not a whole lot of detail on this <clears throat> because, <coughs> excuse me, the, um, the, AMD's GPU open real-time ray tracing is basically what NVIDIA was able to offer before they had the RT cores in the, in the Turing architecture. This is basically using the GPU compute capability of the graphics processor to handle the ray casting and ray tracing uh, effects or uh, traversal kind of memory functions, essentially. The, uh, and, and those were the same between what AMD and NVIDIA could do, right? It was, a, it was mostly... Um, GPU compute based. This is something that you know Nvidia and AMD had both been developing over the last several years. AMD has their plugins. Nvidia has their plugins for different applications as well as uh, you know like the optics system as well. They introduced ray tracing acceleration in some capacity with the Volta architecture, but they never really got into the details of what it was or or, or what it was using. They never brought up the idea of RT cores in there, but they did say that the Volta design did things faster than uh, Pascal. And without really going into into more detail than that, the NVIDIA solution is obviously using these new RT cores, fixed function, uh, probably fixed function logic on the die itself for the the traversal of the um, memory structure for determining where rays intersect and where they do not. Um, so I don't really have any details on what AMD's solution to that or competition that's going to be. Uh, and I don't know if we'll see any instances. Well, I think we will see some instances where we'll be able to run ray tracing on NVIDIA cards with RTX enabled, you know, RTX technology or whatever, versus running it without the RT cores um, uh, on AMD hardware. I think we'll be able to do that because of the uh, Microsoft DirectX ray tracing capabilities that uh, were announced a little while ago. And we have another question on that in a little bit that I think we'll touch on it. Um, Another question from I or L, I, I can't tell, uh, just a single letter here, asks, are the Tensor and RT cores in the new RTX cards helpful for gaming in any ways other than ray tracing? And uh, the answer to that is, is yes. The Tensor cores in particular are, you know, more commonly known as AI processing cores, and the advantages and capabilities or features that AI enablement in gaming uh, are, are just kind of starting out. NVIDIA really only showed one example of that at their tech day, uh, and that was DLSS. It's, uh, you know, the, the essentially deep learning super sampling. It's a, an a anti-aliasing algorithm that uses deep learning, you know, that, that is pre-processed on the cloud, runs on the driver for inference. It's, it's really neat stuff. And you could see how that would be improved over time as you start to improve the deep learning algorithms that created it or you uh, you know just give it feed it more data right both of those things will will improve all AI functions not just this but I think you'll find um, that AI will have some unique implications um, in the in the gaming space as well for animation uh maybe some shading advancements maybe you know the actual artificial intelligence of the game characters itself could be influenced that way so i think i think we're just kind of starting it out as for the rt cores that i don't know i i think it's possible that the rt cores might overlap with some other functions or capabilities that would be useful for graphics but as of right now the only thing that NVIDIA has talked them up as is the acceleration of ray tracing, and that is, you know, such a focus and a goal for them uh, that it makes sense that that those would be those would be dedicated to the to that capability. Next question, Umbra Umbra Lanadi 
I don't know. That's what we're going to go with. Umbra asks, now that NVIDIA has announced the GeForce RTX line, how does it compare with Microsoft DirectX ray tracing announced earlier this year? From what I understand, DXR works with all DX12 graphics cards and Microsoft's collaboration with NVIDIA during its development, or Microsoft collaborated with NVIDIA during its development. Is RTX just an extension or unique implementation of DXR, or is it a separate tech akin to GameWorks? This is actually a really good question. The... Um, the answer is that uh, the so all the ray tracing stuff will be accessible through these APIs. So DirectX ray tracing is one of is is going to be the biggest one, right? And they announced that, and they talked about what capability it was going to offer. And there were a lot of questions when Microsoft made that announcement about what cards could use this, and what was what were the implications, and how deep would that integration be? How forward looking was this announcement? And then you saw the RTX announcement, and you kind of understood. Okay, um, Nvidia has been planning this for a while. It's not something you do overnight. Microsoft was on board with it. They did this implementation. Game developers now have a way to access ray tracing capabilities uh, vendor independently, <clears throat> just like DirectX allows them to do with, with, with gaming capabilities and graphics capabilities. My assertion from that is that at some point, the Radeon line will have ray tracing acceleration in it as well. Whether or not it'll be as good or faster or how long it will take, I don't know. Um, but there will also be Vulkan extensions to allow ray tracing. Uh, and then the NVIDIA RTX technology, if you will, is what maps you know, the DirectX or the Vulkan capability or the NVIDIA optics capability onto the that specific GPU architecture itself. Uh, there were some analogies about it being similar to a GameWorks feature. And I think the fact that it is API-based really makes that a moot point, right? You know, if you look at stuff like Hairworks or you, you know, some of the other uh, uh, physics-based stuff that GameWorks was uh, uh, accused of trying to push Nvidia out or push AMB out of the space or hinder performance in such, dramatic, in such a dramatic way, you know, those were all Nvidia-specific capabilities and features that you know a game developer had to implement uh, that API or not that API, but that library from Nvidia in to do so with with. RTX, it seems like it'll probably be available for both those ways. Like you could maybe go with a more hard coded uh, implementation targeting the NVIDIA Turing RTX RT cores. Uh, but I think it will probably be more likely that you'll just see DXR when that's actually made available. It's not actually even an option in Windows yet. Um, that'll come later this fall. That this will be something that happens. And that's where I believe, back to the first question, that we might actually see some benchmarks or some games that will let you run the ray tracing version of that renderer uh, with the ray tracing effects turned on uh, on AMD GPUs or NVIDIA GPUs that don't have RT cores so we can get some performance comparison, what the acceleration in the hardware is actually doing. And I think that'll be, I think that'll be pretty interesting. Uh, next question comes from You Shot My Monkey. So that's interesting. Uh, now that the tech is officially entering the consumer space, how the heck is it spelled? NVIDIA says Ray Space Tracing. Microsoft says Ray Tracing, all one word. And many AMD references use Ray Dash Tracing. Which is it? Uh, <laughs> well, as the definitive uh, voice in this space, I would say it's two words. Wikipedia says it's two words, and now I believe uh, that's how I've been typing it. I think if you go back to my articles from like a decade ago, I think it's all one word: ray tracing. Um, but you know, now that we have, you know, now that we can talk about ray casting versus ray tracing and the differences between them and s stuff like that. I don't know. But then if you look at DXR, the R indicates that it's one word. Otherwise, it'd be DXRT, right? DX ray tracing, but it's just DXR DX ray tracing. So I don't really. I don't have an answer. I'm going to go with two words, though. I think the answer will be two words. Makes things easier, maybe? I don't know. Next question comes in from Sir Cod. Why didn't NVIDIA include HDMI 2.1 support in the new RTX series cards? Is there any chance that it could be added later, later via a firmware update? Uh, I don't know on that second part. I don't know what capabilities they've built into the into the display output and display control that might be firmware updatable. I just I just don't know. As for why they didn't include it, that's also a good question. It's still relatively new. Um, there was some speculation that they didn't include it because it 
would force you to support VRR, a variable refresh rate, outside of G-Sync. I still believe that the VRR implementation in HDMI is optional. Um, I think that's what in, in, NVIDIA has indicated, and I think I've, I've heard that in a couple of other places. So they could still support the other capabilities of HDMI 2.1 without it. Um, but that will be the prevailing conspiracy theory, I think, for a while, right? Is that they didn't want to do it because they didn't want to be forced into variable refresh that is not G-Sync. Uh, and then, which obviously, if you read PCPer.com in the last week or so, you'll see uh, the story about being able to run free sync on NVIDIA GPUs already, you know, using an APU or a, a GPU as a pass-through, integrated GPU as a pass-through. So um, I don't know. We'll see. That'll be something I'll ask some more as we lead up into the actual launch of the products when the reviews go live, but we'll, we'll find out shortly. Or maybe we won't, and they'll just never say. Micus Mike asks, in a dual boot system with two Windows 10 installations on separate drives, is there a way to prevent them from accessing each other's drives, aka he wants to isolate them? I have one Windows 10 installation with a data drive for gaming, and I don't want any potential malware to be able to affect my second Windows 10 installation, which is for work. I need a native solution, as using virtual machines is not an option in my case. Um Talk to the talk to the guys in the office. The best we can come up with at this point, without getting into virtual machines, which would be you know your best your best option here, is um, in your Windows. When you boot into your Windows work machine, go into computer management and then uh, disk management, and remove the drive letter from the other drive, the D drive, right, or whatever drive letter you had. Uh, it had been automatically assigned. So if you remove that, then technically Windows has access to it but any other application unless it's you know a really robust piece of malware is not going to go looking for unmounted storage devices to remount to then infect um, so if the drive letter is not there that's we think a pretty good line of defense and then you would actually have to you know go back in reboot change the bio setting which is i assume what you're doing for the default boot drive go into your gaming machine go into computer management, disk management, and do the same thing there. Remove the drive letter for the other drive. And then, uh, you know, you can still go into the BIOS, switch between them. Uh, you know, the only the only best option would be every time you reboot, get down, take the side off the computer, and disconnect the SATA cable and reconnect the SATA cable to the other drive. But I think you're trying you're trying to avoid that. So that's, uh, that's what we got. But as far as you know, kind of firewalling stuff off specifically, no no options stand out to us in the Windows environment at least. Uh, let's see, PSL2C asks, will a Ryzen 2700X that is underclocked to 3.2 gigahertz have the same TDP as a stock, 7, uh, stock Ryzen 7 2700? Will XFR Precision Boost be disabled if I underclock it? I want the lower 64-watt TDP for my build, but the 2700X seems to have a better cooler for the small price increase over the 2700. That's an interesting idea. Um, yes, by lowering, uh, by downclocking the 2700X, you will run at a lower TDP. Also, you should be able to lower the voltage as well. So if you undervolt as well as underclock, um, you'll be able to, to lower the TDP, maybe below the 65-watt level if you want to as well. And it's also worth. It's also possible, I, I do some searching around on Google, see if you can find some underclocking guides for uh, the Ryzen 2700X. You may be able to get pretty close to that 65-watt level without actually underclocking it. Um, it obviously depends on what the sustained workload is and all that. If you do decide to underclock, I'm pretty sure you'll have to disable XFR and Precision Boost um, manually, there would just be other BIOS options for that if that's the case. Uh, so just look for those to disable. Um, but it, yeah, the 2700X is going to come with a different cooler in the box, and uh, yeah. So if you're if that's your goal, that's what I would do. I I, I would I would think I, I don't know if you you say underclock to 3.2 gigahertz. I assume that's the base clock of the 65 watt part. Um, you probably be able to go higher than that if you're trying to make it a static peak clock as opposed to uh, enabling XFR and whatnot. But I do think that the XFR and Precision Boost would actually take it above your TDP level since that's what the, the processors actually spec that. So, uh, but look at undervolting as well as underclocking. LCTR Games wants to know, says Alan has mentioned that third-party solutions for cooling M.2 flash 
or just flash in general, I guess, but M.2 is the one we're, we're looking at here, may increase wear, but cooling the controller could prevent thermal throttling, especially on early M.2 drives. This is still something to be concerned about. Additionally, is the same true for Optane drives? How do Optane packages and controllers respond to heat or cooling? Uh, so the first part of the question is, yeah, it's still something to be concerned about, right? The uh, the basic basic overview of the theory is, the controllers, when they get hot, will throttle, so you should cool those. However, the flash actually has a longer lifespan if it stays warm, so you don't really want to or need to cool that. As for as far as Optane drives, the controller, yes, obviously, yeah, if, when a controller overheats, it's it's going to potentially throttle. As for the the Optane packages, the 3D cross point themselves, the, the answer is we don't really know for sure, but Alan believes, based on some of the the chemistry and physics involved with 3D Crosspoint versus Flash, that it probably makes sense just to go ahead and cool the whole thing um, for best performance, long-term, you know, lifespan, etc. cetera. Uh, but the, the, on, the fully honest answer is we don't know for sure, uh, as I don't think we have that kind, of, that kind of data and robust testing done on 3D Crosspoint yet. Uh, let's see. Ed asks, as a follow-up to last episode's questions about RAM prices, are the tariffs expected to increase RAM prices? What other PC hardware products could be impacted? That's a good question. Um, I actually had a conversation with, with uh, a, a vendor about this a couple of weeks ago, and they expressed concern over things like power supplies being dramatically affected by, like, say, a 25% cost increase in the tariffs because of the components they were using. However, something like graphics cards would be, and was still an unknown to them. I think memory would also be in that, in that space. Um, I know, I think on September 1st, maybe, September 2nd, there's actually supposed to be another hearing about which products are going to be affected, which products aren't going to be affected in that. Um, but that's a real, it's, it is a real concern for consumers that are, are looking to, you know, we buy all that stuff from, from Taiwan and Chinese manufacturing for the most part. Um, might give Micron a leg up. They could produce all that stuff locally, sell it locally, avoid the tariffs, uh, while Samsung and, and Hynix and those guys would, would be, um, you know, affected by it. So it'll be interesting to see how, how that pans out. Uh, let's see. Last, we'll take this last question. John STF seventy two asks, "Do you think disc based media is pretty much dead, or will they always find increases in capacities in future optical media formats?" Do I think the PS five or Xbox Scarlet will ditch the optical drive? I believe, much to Josh Walrus's dismay, that optical media is probably going to go away forever. Um, you know, it's been a long time since we've seen significant, like, consumer-level advances in optical media. Uh, it's been a while since we've seen improvements in performance of optical media as well. And flash continues to get less expensive. Uh, I, I just, I just think that there's, there's, there's going to be a change over here, and, it, and I think it would make sense. I think the PS5 and, and the Xbox might still have optical drives. If nothing else, then for backwards compatibility uh, and, and things like that, I, I think the biggest is, you know, internet connectivity. Right? Everybody can't always download 50, 60 gigabyte games, especially on launch day, and the infrastructure for that. And you know, if you have three megabit DSL or something, that's obviously a problematic. Um, maybe they'll sell them without it, and then you can buy an optional external optical drive. Uh, if if you specifically need uh, that for those reasons, but um, yeah, I think streaming, flash prices, internet speeds all point to the end of optical media formats, and Josh will just have to hold on to all his forever and ever. Uh, that's going to be it for the mailbag this week. Again, if you have questions for us, leave them in the comments on this video or in the comments on PCPro.com where this video is embedded. And we thank you guys for uh, for participating and hanging out. I hope you found it useful, and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Mm -hmm.